Welcome to the Unearthed Man Podcast, the journey of becoming a conscious man, hosted by Milva. Hey all, Milva here and welcome to episode 17 of the Unearthed Man Podcast. Um, thanks a lot for Brendan Bam Jarrell, who was on the podcast last week, such a, an amazing, beautiful man. And since interviewing Bam, um, I've also implemented some of the some of the items that we talked about, in particularly around the cacao. So uh, I now purchase uh, my cacao off Seth Slade, who was also on the Unearth Man podcast. Um, and I go now through the process of every day myself and Jackie as part of our routine of getting up, cold shower, hydrating ourselves, uh, tongue scraping our meditation and then we sit down for about the last 20 odd minutes before I start my day and just enjoy this beautiful Samoan organic cacao and I could not recommend it highly enough to anybody. Uh, Definitely uh, jump on and source some of that amazing cacao. Um, The link was, if you go back to the episode with Seth Slade, the the link's in there to go and purchase it. Um, As I said, highly recommended. In relation to the format for the podcast moving forward, I'm changing it up a little bit and I've reached out to another eight men who have signed on to do interviews. So the rest of the series for 2020, so series one, will actually be all interview based with a whole lot of beautiful men who are very happy to come on and actually start to also share their story. So That's how we'll run through as to what Series 2 looks like. I'll have to revisit that, um, but put a call out to as many men as I can. I actually really enjoyed doing the interviews, and I think some of the feedback coming back in is people are also enjoying the interview-style process. So that's pretty much what will happen for the rest of the year. So before we uh, go on... um, I just want to say thank you again for all the feedback I've received. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and also on LinkedIn. Um, And there's a brand new app um, called Awaken, so the Awaken community. It's also a very spiritual, uh, like-minded community app, and I'm also putting some promotion up into there. So I'd highly recommend uh, if you want to see what's happening in a different world that's outside of uh, the likes of Facebook um, and Instagram, where I've got my own views about the potential censorships happening in those, if you want to get onto another platform where you have a bit more open-minded people, then certainly the Awaken app is the place to go to. So that's it for me. Um, I'm not going to go anymore. Again, thank you very much for being a supporter of my podcast and let's get on with episode 17. My guest today is an actor currently based in Melbourne, born and raised in Canberra. He loved films throughout his childhood, but as he emerged into adulthood, the attraction of a more stable and secure future led him to leave a u- university at 18 and enter the nine to five workforce. In his early twenties, whilst working in IT for a government department, playing amateur football with his local university team and having been in a committed relationship, he realised he wasn't following his passions anymore. He quit his job and moved down to Melbourne, aiming to pursue a career in the Australian film industry. While studying nights and weekends, he found himself in full-time work again at a top four professional services firm, but realised he wasn't pursuing his heart's true purpose and decided again to take a leap of faith. At 28 years old, he made the bold decision to quit full-time employment altogether and pursue acting, training and freelance work in the film industry. Soon after, he landed a small TV guest role and decided to commit himself to studying the craft of acting. Throughout the last six years, he has carved a path of rapid self-discovery and ongoing self-inquiry. During this deeply therapeutic work, an acting coach and mentor recommended he seek out and work with an embodiment and lifestyle coach named Michael Holt, based in California. After a couple of private sessions with Michael, he began studying archetypes, rites of passage, and exploring methods to deepen a more authentic expression of his previously wounded masculinity. Today, he juggles his time working in production aspects of the film and TV industry, navigating a burgeoning acting career, and regular involvement in two different men's communities based primarily online, Tribe Men's Community, based out of California, and a local private men's group run by Rod Gordon in Torquay here in Australia. 
His interest in leading men's groups, continue, continuing to study and explore what it means to be a man in today's society. And looking to future opportunities to integrate men's work with acting training to help mentor and foster growth in young men. He's continually working on himself to become a better partner, son, brother, friend, mentor, and role model for the people in his life and the wider community. With an aim to normalize open-hearted, vulnerable conversations between men and ultimately all human beings and be a future role model for young men. Welcome to the Unearthed Man podcast, Jack Doherty. Hey, Jack. Hey, Milbo. Thank you, mate. Thank you. What, a, what an introduction. <laughs> yeah, man, it's, a, it's an awesome bio there. And um, I just love the fact of, you know, there's a point in time where you just decided to, you know, take, take on your life's passion. Um, you had a couple of goes at it, which, which I think is really indicative about, you know, where we need to be and the courage that you've probably shown. Um, I think a lot of men would try the first time, found it didn't work and, you know, maybe given up. So let's, uh, let's maybe start in that space. Um, talk me a little bit through that journey and, you know, your willingness to continue to sort of push and strive to you know, become an actor. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think that uh, it wasn't necessarily a very um, aware, like I wasn't really making a very conscious decision, I wouldn't say. I, I was to the extent that I could at the time. Um, and this is my early 20s and, um, and, and then late 20s making those two jumps. Um, I remember in my early 20s, I was working in government in, in a nine to five job in IT and I just made this decision to move. And um, uh, I didn't really even talk it through with my girlfriend at the time. She kind of just followed me down and we've been together for many years. But I, I just wanted to break out, break free. And I think now I think about that and I think like it, it's almost like I could make those leaps because I wasn't as aware of like the the fear that was coming up of what the unknown meant, like what what was on the horizon or beyond the horizon. Um, and, but, you know, but it's an interesting thing because in some ways I think fear can be somewhat of a compass towards what you need to pursue. Um, and so I think as I got into film, I, I sort of thought I wanted to direct and I was working my way into that. And then I dabbled in acting and sort of, it, it, acting is interesting because obviously you become the focus of everyone's attention, which is something that we all kind of want. We all want to be seen, yep. but also we kind of don't want to be seen, you know, like you can see me in the way that I'm willing to show you me. Yeah, <laughs> yes, true. Be vulnerable on my, my terms of what vulnerable means. Um, and so uh, eventually I, I tried to do some acting study because I, was, I wanted to know how to work with actors as a director because there was a real sense of like, oh, these people that are actors, they're really different. There's something about them that, you know, like how do I work with them better? And then, yeah, when I started to dip my toes, I realised how much I, I loved it, you know. I mean, when I first stepped onto a film set at 20... 26 I think um it was like fucking the student film was two in the morning and I was like in love with it I was like oh my god I found the thing that I want to do with my life um and it was a profound moment like it was literally a, a, I'd never felt so in the right place um in in all my life um yep. and and especially having grown up playing a lot of sport, I, you know, like I was creative as a kid, but I played a lot of sport and sport became a lot of my identity. Um, my, my, my body, my physicality, my looks, like all those things were, were the identity that, that I was being given reflected back and shifted into thinking that was my value. And yet there was a part of me that was deeply dissatisfied with how much there was to offer inside of me, um, whether that was my intellect or really it was my self-expression um and so yeah so those those sort of jumps were were big shifts you know and i still to this day people say like man i can't believe you are so brave to just break out and chase your dreams you know and it hasn't been an easy ride it still isn't in many ways um but me as a person i feel i feel very grateful that i've gone down this road because 
you know, I think my higher self kind of knew to drag me down this direction because just getting into acting introduced me to men's work and it's become a defining piece of my life now. Yeah, so, so let's, um, let's now touch on that because uh, an outsider looking in, there's men's work, which is, you know, uh, seeking the deep truth, you know, digging down and finding the deep truth for who we are and, and, and getting through all the traumas. Um, film, acting on the outside looks like it's further from the deep truth because it is actually that. It's actually pretense. It's acting to be something that you're not so how do you how do you align is there congruence or incongruence between you know every day you're working at who the true person is whilst in another light you're actually you you have to pretend to be something that you're actually not how does that work yeah i mean i think that's most people's perspective um of, of acting and i think that you know, before I started to really study acting, that was my perspective from the outside was like, wow, these people can, that, like when I was a kid, I remember watching films as a kid and I wasn't even really aware as a kid that they were actors on a screen. I, I knew that they were these like people who their hair and their teeth and their face and their bodies and their outfits always looked really perfect. You know, yeah. I knew that and I was like, that's, that's kind of cool. Like every time they shoot something, these people always are in the like most perfect position um but you know looking back now what i think that really was about is they the best ones the best actors and you know back when i was a kid in the 80s and 90s and watching those films that was maybe 10 15 years after the film industry had actors who were getting paid massive amounts of money um and before that acting wasn't really associated with celebrity the way it is now so yep. Um, I guess what I'm trying to what I'm trying to point out is that the most most of the acting we see now I don't think is representative of what acting really is. It, it looks like it's about pretense and it's about an illusion, but to me, acting has always been about deep truth, which aligns completely with what why men's work was so important and why body embodiment work was something that um, a great friend and mentor of mine introduced me to go and work on. Um, and I guess that's where we can start is I'd done a bit of acting training along the way. And, um, you know, the first thing about acting we think is that it's like, Oh, let's, I've got to learn these lines. And then I just say these lines and I say these lines to you and I'm saying these ones and you say those ones back. So I listen for when you say that one, and when you say the end of that word, then I say my line. And that's what it looks like at a surface level. But it's not very fun for an audience to watch because there's nothing happening moment to moment. There's no compelling nature of like in, in real life, if we're having a conversation right now, you don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I'm going to say. And yeah. here we are intrigued. Like what's, what's going to come out. You know, you don't like acting when you're watching someone on stage or on screen and you kind of know what they're going to say because they're not discovering it for themselves as it comes out of their mouth. Um, and the other actor doesn't isn't um, responding in the moment to what they're saying. They, they know the lines, they've already heard it, and they're just waiting for their turn to speak, and that's really not very fun to watch. Yes, I agree. But, um, but so when I, when I was training early on, eventually I came across this woman um, who, who's the mentor I speak of, and she, she ran these workshops called Raw Truth, and Raw Truth was about doing some deeply in some ways therapeutic processes that had a combination of um, sort of like a embodied psychology processes to almost like psychological um, cognitive behavioral therapy processes, those sort of things that allowed actors to strip away all the blocks that got in the way. Any, okay. any, learned behavior from uh, as a child where it's like if you're angry as a little kid some people will dismiss their child's anger and yet a child is just freely expressing what they're expressing and as parents and, and as adults we want to be pretty conscious to that um and and allow that expression because because the child's always learning right like yes if i if I scream out loud and mum and dad tell me off and put me in a room, then I guess I won't do that again because otherwise I won't get their love. 
and that becomes conditioning. So then, of course, when you're an adult and suddenly you have to express rage in a scene, all these neurological blocks will come up to protect you because the, the guardians, as they're called, will want to stop that expression because that expression might cause you to not be loved. And this is deeply psychological, right? So Absolutely, yep. Yeah, so this teacher, she would run these workshops and strip away all these things, these conditioned beliefs in a way, and then have the actors do the scene they'd been working on. And the, the level of truth in the work was phenomenal. Like I've never seen truth like that. And, and I've done many of these workshops since and I worked really closely with her um, for a few years now. But that was when it kind of illuminated to me like, oh, I have some deep work of myself to do to, to allow myself to fully express myself. Um, mm. and, and that's how she kind of led me to the, uh, eventually to working with the embodiment coach. I was going over to America for a wedding at the time. I was going to visit her in L.A., and then she was like, hey, you should work with this dude. And that's when I first discovered the concepts of archetypes and embodiment. I didn't know what they meant. I picked up the King Warrior Magician Lover book. I yes. think we've read that before. And, uh, and I started going deep on understanding that and understanding Carl Jung um, theory and archetypes and deeply gone into his work since all those years ago. Um, and And so to me, like my pursuit with acting in particular is to bring full absolute truth to, to what I'm, what I'm performing um, to the best of my ability at this time. And it's a constant, it's, it's really a lifetime, a lifetime craft because um, it's, it's sort of like, it's akin to, you know, like a carpenter maybe kind of learns how to have skills to build something. Then I had to make joints, then I had to, work with wood and work with specific tools. And then each carpenter has their particular flair, which is their own personal influence on whatever they're building. Yep. And I think of acting in that way now where it's like there's craft in order to do what's standardly accepted as a table or a chair. You know, it's functional and it works for what it needs to be. But then there's the, the flair of that particular carpenter, mm. um, maybe their style or their their instinct, their intuition when they're working with the wood or working with how to construct it, you know, how to visualise something that's deep in them and how to, how to bring it out um, yeah. into the world. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that I've gone a bit of a tangent, but I think that, that that kind of points out, like I think for me, I don't think there's heaps of examples of really truthful acting, but I think when it, there's an actor that we love, an actor that we really enjoy watching every time, the really top actors, um, I think they do that. They're, to me, they're fully realised humans a lot of yeah. the time. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes some people are very good mimics and um, that's that's a different thing. That's probably a bit more deceitful. Yeah. But an actor where they express something as a character and it hits you in your heart, it hits you in a way that you, you know, your mirror neurons essentially pick up on what's happening and experience it for yourself, then that's when it's true um, for me. And, and that's, that's at least my pursuit. Um, and I think that's what acting used to be. I think that's what Shakespeare yeah. was doing with his stuff. And, you know, yeah. Nah, and um, so, so thanks for that because, you know, my, my takeaway from that is the, you know, probably the opposite to where we started, which is around to be able to be felt, as an actor, the, the actor themselves has to truly feel vulnerable and actually be able to tap into that level of their own self vulnerability and tap into that own level of emotion. And whether that be because they've been through an embodiment process or been through some other uh, way of learning how to tap into that that pain or that trauma or or something where that emotion sat, so that when they're actually playing that role be it in a film or a TV show, they can actually tap into that space where, you know, the pain is or the, the, the tears, the emotion uh, and all those elements are or the happiness or the joy and, and being able to tap into all those and, and actually bring it out because then what they're displaying is actually true emotion that's coming through. The words might have been made up in a story or a, or a script, but the emotion is actually true and you're right. They're the ones that we can actually truly connect with and why you know there's great movies where we all end up in tears 
yeah, at the movie theater watching them. And there's movies that go straight to DVD <laughs> <laughs> because you know, like, yeah, okay, then you didn't quite touch on where I wanted you to go to on that one. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Yeah. That's so true. That's a funny reflection because I mean, it's true. I, it, it's filmmaking is a very complex art form um, as, as I'm sure you're aware, but um, yeah, I think that, you know, it's, if the performance isn't, isn't as truthful as it really needs to be. If, if the actor's not taking the risk to just lean in vulnerably um, to that experience and, and, and I guess be um, in the, in that and be present to that. I think that's yeah. the other thing that um, at least that's been a recent discovery for me is I think that, for acting to work too, the the two actors or however many actors there are need to be extremely present with each other um, moment to moment. And that means, that means a few things. It means like not being caught up in the head with any thoughts about wh- how the scene's going, about the audience, about um, if they fucked up a line a few yep. months before. Um, it, it has to, they have to be completely present, which again is an alignment to me with a lot of the men's work that, that I do is a, a lot of the time there's, there's practices that I do daily and there's practices that are constantly brought up in these groups and in, in face-to-face workshops, we do a lot of stuff where you're cultivating the ability to be really present. Um, and, and, you know, I think what comes to mind for me is I think most people who are listening to your podcast probably have seen the film called Pretty Woman. Yes. And there's that famous scene when Richard Gere is showing her the ring and he snaps the case shut and Julia Roberts bursts into that laughter. Now, as I understand it, that, was a, that wasn't written. That was Richard Gere just doing that kind of on the, in the moment. And Julia Roberts was so present to that. She had that completely truthful experience of that where she burst out laughing you know and the connection in that moment is priceless it's such a yeah. an image that sticks in everyone's mind and i don't think that would happen if if he'd done that and she had a preconceived idea of well you're not supposed to do that they would have lost an opportunity for a moment and a lot of a lot of acting is taught about you have to take the risk to be really present because you never know you can't create we don't know how we're going to respond to something emotionally you know and i think we see that in life all the time people have often paradoxical reactions emotionally to an experience. You know, people can be watching the footy and, and their team wins and most people might be cheering and then someone who deeply cares is bursting into tears, you know. <laughs> That's like, right. <laughs> I don't know if you watched the Michael Jordan um, doco, The Last Dance, but the first time he wins a championship, he like bursts into tears and collapses. He's hugging the, the trophy on the ground, you know, and I think... Mm. Who would have thought that he he would do that? It's like the damn walls opened and all his emotion came out. Yeah. Um, and that to me is a great expression of like, I mean, he was someone who was present and that's why he was so above everyone because he was just dialed in all the time, like all the time, you know. And it's, mm. it's a secret sauce. It's a secret recipe to like getting the most out of life to be right in the moment. Yeah. And I think we see that a couple of occasions where, you know, um, some of the great comedy actors mm. uh, apparently been nightmares to work with because there's the script and then there's the ad lib. And a lot of the <laughs> stuff that ends up in the film is just two great comedy actors just doing an ad lib piece that actually stayed in the film and they threw away the rest of the script because it just became so powerful that they kept it in there. But then you go to the outtakes and you see these people just dropping out all these silly one liners just to try and put, you know, the, the reaction to put everyone off. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and there's something interesting that's happening now in the world, and I think this is a consequence of having um, a, a, a lack of deep truth in times in, in some, the amount of shows that are made. I mean, there's definitely an overwhelming amount of different things you can watch on different streaming mm. services. But what's happening at the moment in the last couple of years in Hollywood is that they've been, the studios have been seeking out comedians from the doing stand-up in the clubs and writing shows around them um, because it doesn't matter whether or not they can act. What matters is that they, they truly express themselves as they are. Mm. And, and then it, it, it's like that's what's so entertaining because that's what, that's what we love to see when we see an actor take on a role and make it their own. 
um, and I think that's a great experience. If you think about like Bruce Willis in Die Hard, he was such an odd pick for that, but yet I can't think of that film series working with any other actor. Yes. You know, if you think of any other action actor that was around at that time, slotting them into that role, it just you wouldn't have that UPKA motherfucker line, you wouldn't have all that stuff that's clearly Bruce Willis's flavour. Same with Harrison Ford, you know, in the Star Wars films. Like you can't imagine Han Solo being anyone but Harrison Ford because it, his particular flavour just worked. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, correct. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's what they brought to the table. I, I was just going to touch back on the other point about that, um, you know, being present in the moment. I had two occasions in the last few years where um, I, I went and did a boxing match, um, so trained up, signed in and, and, and boxed. Um, the finished the match. There was such a lead into it. Finished the match when you know went went out the back where you sat, and I just just burst into tears. Like, and it wasn't about like someone who'd come to watch me came out at that point in time, and I'm in tears, and I'm thinking they probably think I'm crying because I lost, but it wasn't yeah. that. <laughs> like, it didn't matter whether I won or lost. It, it was just that that release. And and last this year, I did the um the lawn pier to pub swim. And it's mm. something that I'd always been on my bucket list to do. And I finished it. And wow. I remember coming out and, and my wife was there, Jackie was there to, to group me afterwards. And like I'd smashed the time I thought I'd even get close to. And again, I just completely broke down. And yeah. it was just this release of emotion. When I thought through that emotion, I'd remembered that I'd nearly drowned actually swimming in the ocean when I was about 12. And a guy had actually come and rescued me and I could never work out why I couldn't, I couldn't open up my eyes when I was doing ocean swimming. And it was that whole of going through the process, almost beating it, but then actually allowing everything else to come up. And it wasn't until I'd actually, you know, uh, finish all the crying and the tears and, and letting that emotion come out that that thought, that memory came back up and I'm like, wow, how long I've been storing that memory, you know, and and ever since then. So it's interesting how, you know, you need to go through those moments, but you need to allow that, you know, not be embarrassed. Like if you're Jordan lying on the ground crying because you got the trophy because of, you know, that's a culmination of life that resulted in in that moment and just allow that, that, that emotion to come out and be really present. Yeah, you know, that you make me think of a couple of things there. Um, in reflection of that i mean there's you know with jordan it's like well how how is he supposed to be you know it's and he doesn't think of that he's he's there like going i mean he does he always did things on his term Mm. um on his terms and uh i think that's what we want people in the world to do um but it's interesting because you know speaking of congruency and incongruency there's there's a level of incongruency in the world in the the surface world and how we're supposed to fit into society. You know, I think how we behave emotionally in public has been um, like squashed into this sort of, um, how do I describe this? Like, you know, we think about waves of sound and how if they're, if the waves are really big, um, then then the sounds, I think that means they're big. But anyway, and, and it, we're kind of reducing the the range of feeling that's allowed in, in public in society because it's what's what's acceptable what's what's um yeah what's acceptable in society and there's obviously value to that but i think that in place of that we've got to a point where we don't express ourselves very freely and there's so many people in the world who are feeling so unexpressed Mm -hmm. um and you know something that i realized last week um uh, a week and a half ago i was i was working on a scene with um, this mentor of mine she's been running some classes and I went to work on a scene and I had to access a lot of vulnerability and rage um, embodied in the scene I was playing a domestically violent man who's trying to get his um, ex-wife back and in preparation for the scene I was warming up my voice and I picked up probably the most famous speech in Shakespeare Hamlet's to be or not to be Yep. And I read through that a few times. And I mean, I've read it a few times. I've started to study some Shakespeare, but I wouldn't say I've deeply done much study in Shakespeare. I've started to be introduced to it. Um, 
I'm aware that it's something that seems very distant and scary to me, but it's also the most perfect material for me to really push myself to be able to do um, because it requires a very well-trained and refined um, b- body and mind and vocal ability and and in fully embodied acting. You can't, you go yeah. see Shakespeare on stage and if, if it's all heady acting, it's not interesting. Yeah. What's interesting about Shakespeare is he would write the breath pattern into his speeches so that if the actor is speaking it in line with the pattern, the breath pattern, the, 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 the um, that sound, if the actor speaks to that, the emotion comes up through the body anyway. Okay. If you, if wow. Surrender to it. Yeah. Um, you know, Woody Harrelson talks about, there's a great film he was in with Christian Bale, um, probably went straight to DVD, but it's an amazing film. It's called um, uh, Out of the Furnace. And Woody Harrelson plays this really, really terrible bad guy. And in an interview afterwards, I was watching an interview with him and he said, acting really is about dynamic relaxation. And it speaks to that idea you were saying before about you have to be able, you have to allow yourself to be so relaxed to feel what is coming up that it valves that emotion. And as we grow older, we might, uh, we might be able to access traumas and feelings and emotions and experiences that have been buried into our body like animals. Mm. But when we can allow that with consciousness, it, it liberates it. Um, and he speaks to that. But the thing about Shakespeare that was amazing the other week for me is I was reading to be or not to be, that is the question. Now, the structure of that, um, of the pattern means it's a 10, it's a 10 part. So it goes to be or not to be, that is the quest. And that's 10. And chun of question is 11. So the sentence itself is actually to be, so to be in the world yes. or not to be, to not be in the world. That is the quest. That is the point of life. But it's also a question because it's a question we have to ask ourselves. Do I want to be or not be? Wow. And that's, I mean, to me, that's like, fuck, that, that was written back in the whatever, 14, 1500s. And, and we, don't, we don't understand that. I mean, why that isn't something that we talk about in the world and, and identify as like, do we be in the world or do we not be in the world um, baffles me. Because I think, you know, the world has this thing where people are trying to be something, especially in the age of social media and, and modern technology. There's a lot of wanting to create a profile through other people's adulation, yes. adulation, but it's often very empty. Yeah, yeah. I I could not agree with you more on that one. Let's let, let continue on. Sorry, let's continue. No, no. I mean, I mean that's kind of the, the, the only two points I really yeah. was making the long way is the dynamic relaxation and the willingness to be and and i think vulnerability itself is is it take is a courageous act of surrendering and allowing us to be where we are and trusting that we can be accepted in that yes. way yeah it's about it's about removing as you've spoken a bit earlier about you know what are all those masks what are all those uh pretenses that we're actually putting out there in front of us um to you know hey this is who i am or is it more about this is who i am or this is who i want to be or this is who i think someone thinks i should be and it's trying to to break through that um so so you've touched on uh the last few weeks and you've touched on social media um i now notice that you've removed yourself from social media uh in this day and time and um I must admit it's something I had thought about doing, but then when you sort of run a podcast, there is you know, social media is the the channel to tell people that you're doing stuff. Um, yeah. So let's talk through that process. Um, you, you and I had a bit of brief chat before we jumped on the podcast as well, and you spoke about the last few weeks you've found to be really challenging. So yeah, let, let's explore that. I'm really keen to understand and explore where you're at and what all that looks like for you and, and why are you now not on social media? Yeah, well, um, cool. So, I, uh, so this time of isolation, when it started, I was I was boldly excited for it because I felt like having spent a few years um, 
being self-reflective and I mean, really that's happened most of my life, but in the last few years, meditating daily and having practices and, you know, willing to open myself up, I was like, oh, cool. Like I'm going to be well geared for this kind of situation where I have to be with myself a lot. And I think, you know, the virus has forced that. A lot of people had to hit the brakes on everything around them and go back into their homes. And, um, you know, I'm fascinated to see what kind of stories come out because I think there'd be a lot of um, ending of relationships, a lot of deepening of relationships, a lot of mending and repairing um, and, and some really interesting new connections um, and not just locally, probably internationally. Yeah. But, but so my initial kind of introduction into this world of isolation was positive. And then I think there were waves of stuff that hit me. And part of that was to do with what was coming through social media, um, particularly all the fear and all the numbers and all the concern. And I had to distance, distance myself from that initially. Um, and I try to use social media pretty consciously and have for a few years once I realized that it was kind of designed to be addictive intentionally, which it is. Yes. Um, that's something that everyone talks about um, if you if you look into it, and uh, and I guess I just I had this love hate relationship with social media because I think it's a very powerful tool, it's a very powerful technology, but I don't think we understand it collectively, um, and so I think it, um, like for instance, Twitter. I, I've never used Twitter. Um, I really don't see any positivity on Twitter from from the second hand. Um, things I hear about it, um, and I think it. I think it's it doesn't cost anyone anything to be negative or critical um, using you know 140 characters or whatever it is on a phone with a pseudonym or even with your with your real name. It doesn't really matter. You, yep. There's a certain distance. There's no cost. Um, anyway, so then as we went deeper into this isolation period, I hit a point where I decided I needed to go and work with a psychologist, um, which I had done many years ago, but I think I wasn't really in my body. I wasn't, I was very heady, very intellectual. And so when I was working with that psychologist, thinking my way out of my head, wasn't really the answer. Yep. Um, and that naturally ended when it did, but I went back and got a psychologist and we started working a couple of months ago together once a week. And using processes with him i went through exploring a few things and a lot of that was even just like how do emotions show up in my life and how do they show up in acting and 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 the relationship between me and acting and all those sort of things um so that was sort of a journey but that started to bring up a lot of stuff um as it does and i also had deepened my meditation practice which um also i guess the more you sit still the more that can arise and and that begins to bring stuff up into your life to be felt. Yep. And then of course you can choose whether you want to experience that or, or run from it or um, uh, distract yourself from it or numb out or whatever it is, you know, seek some kind of release elsewhere. Um, but, yeah, so over the period of this isolation, I started getting very stiff in my body, a lot of tension. My lower back was locking up really badly. Um, you know, and I'm 35, I keep fit. I've always kept pretty fit. Um, I'm a pretty, I stretch daily, like, and it sort of made no sense to me. I was literally like, I'd be on my bed for 20 minutes and then I could barely get off my bed. And I was like, what is, what is going on? So eventually I went and got some work with a Cairo who also was a kinesiologist. And um, between working with him for a few weeks and then having a blood, a, a urine test done and having something identified um, called cryptopyriol, which is a pretty new idea or something, but it's basically there's a, there's a condition where if you have a high count of pyroles in your blood cells and your red blood cells, it can negate the absorption of certain minerals, um, minerals like B6, zinc, manganese, and uh, magnesium. Okay. And so... And they're all available in food, but they a lot of them have other processes. They like help with energy levels, adrenal, you know, your adrenal glands, thyroid, um, uh, tendon repair, muscle repair, um, uh, stress management. It's a big one, zinc yep. especially. 
And so I was probably getting a lot of those minerals out of my system before I was absorbing them. And so between getting a compound of minerals from him that I started taking a week and a half ago, um, my, my energy levels are completely different. I woke up, I wake up in the morning now and my mind's positive. Um, and between that and also with the psych working on distancing myself from thoughts that were embedded in my body, um, th there's been this sort of release of a, a negative thinking pattern that I think I've had for a long time in my life and it sort of interrupted me being very present in the world. I think I was good at acting like I was present in the world, um, but being deeply vulnerably present in the world wasn't wasn't my true experience okay. um, and so the with the psych the, the distancing thoughts was a process that was allowing me to kind of unhook thoughts that were coming and and becoming absorbed or fused into me there's it's a diffusion process and that was what was causing a lot of tension in my body i would have a, a self-judgment or a negative thought i wouldn't really hear it because i'd worked on meditation for so long that my mind was clear and i could steer my mind to being clear yeah but those thoughts came i could i would throw them and end up in a pile that was in my lower back probably <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway so yeah so between those two things i went through this really dark period um and you know i was getting up in the morning and stretching and meditating as i do and i started reading a gratitude prayer you know i started doing gratitude process which was really wonderful and reading like a morning prayer but the morning prayer would be like be grateful for waking up another day and I got to a point where I was like I'm not actually that grateful this is fucked like I'm not enjoying this um I didn't ever feel like I wanted to end anything I wasn't I wasn't having suicidal thoughts but I was definitely feeling this is this is really um challenging because I keep waking up and being like what is the purpose what, what why and like what is the point I haven't okay. like, what I'm getting anywhere as much as I was like working hard to meditate every day and to have open conversations and connecting with the men's groups I was connected to. And, um, and I think ultimately there was just some physiological and some thought based stuff going on for me that I had to get addressed. And I'm so glad that I took myself to a psych and started working with him and that I took a leap and started working with a different, um, with, with a chiro kinesiologist and kind of working with him. Um, because I feel totally different now. And now with that, I can bring along all the processes that I've been learning, meditation, the structure in my life, like, you know, planning, all these sort of things. Um, yeah, so that, I guess that's, uh, that's sort of, that explains the journey of the last yeah. few weeks. Excellent. So uh, first of all, th thanks for sharing that because, you know, um, it always takes courage to be able to, to share the fact that, you know, if, if we're not down because the easiest path is to, um, wake up and put on that sunny face and, you know, just throw the mask out there. We're all right. And yeah, she'd be right, mate. And we'll be all good. But to recognize the fact that, you know, you weren't doing well and to put steps into place is, is, yeah, is enormous. So yeah, thanks for sharing that, man. That's, that's really cool. Um, yeah. yeah and I'm a, I'm a huge believer. Um, I never was up until now. I, I love that term up until now because <laughs> it helps redefine where we're at. Um, yeah. That yeah, we, we our bodies are a great way of storing those emotions that we choose not to deal with. Um, you know, so uh, my wife, there's a book that we have uh, in a cigar, the secret language of your body, and uh, mm -hmm. it's a really powerful book because whenever you're feeling like when any of us are feeling any pain, or well, I straight right straight the yellow book, and uh, you know it's like what is oh, happening. Sure. What, what is happening in your life? Like, what are you holding on to? What are you not? What are you not letting go? What are you trying to control? Um, what what has come up? You know, and where that sits. And it's interesting because we talk to you know. I, I used to have you know go for a run and then you know I uh, hurt a calf. You know, be be a small tear or a strain. Yeah. And even that, my wife will go, yeah. So what were you holding on to in relation to something in your calf? Because the reason why it gave in is because you had a weak spot there because of emotion that you were holding in there. It was already under stress. It was already under tension. It mm. itself was a weak spot. So when we have injuries, you know, be it running or swimming or whatever other things, exercise we do, we often just go, oh, 
you know, I foot push myself too hard, overtraining injury or whatever else it is, is to be. But if you take a step back and go, the reason why you injured that spot is because there was already a weakness in that spot because there was something you hadn't dealt with before. It sort of changes the perspective on how you see things and how you operate. Um, and there's a whole lot of protocols in the book that if you do for two weeks can actually fundamentally help you move beyond, you know, release and actually also, um, deal with and handle some of those, those emotions that have been stored there. And, and a lot of people have, um, that Jackie deals with that she talks to, they're actually getting really good results by, you know, applying to the, um, the protocols that, that go along with that. So yeah, it's, it, it's an interesting one. So the kinesiology sits in that space. You know, I know the kinesiology often deals in that. Where is that energy being held? Where's that energy being stored? Um, where are you still tied from a negative energy point of view? And how do you go about breaking that tie to that negative energy? Yeah. You know, whether it be a person, whether it be a, a post, whether it be an argument, whether it be something else. And how do we go about breaking that to free up that energy to be then used on, on a more positive front? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, one other thing that I was doing during that period was I started reading a book called The Body Keeps the Score. I don't know if you've ever heard of that one. No, I haven't. But yeah, keep going. Well, it's a book about trauma and about how um, trauma changes the way the brain works and changes the, um, the body's way of coping, I guess. If, if we experience trauma at a young age, um, it, it basically inhibits some of the development of the brain and um and then we can end up being perpetually in a in a kind of fight or flight state um you know high levels of cortisol the stress hormone and um and not having systems to kind of to 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 i guess be in the world a bit more fully Mm. Uh, because the world i guess through our experience and perception might not be a very safe place um uh, so it's interesting because, you know, something that I think, uh, and, and this to me speaks to, you know, post-war parenting. We had we had a, two world wars in at least the generations before us and our parents and grandparents. Um, I mean, we're different in age, but, you know, it's still kind of the same. Uh, your parents and my parents and then our grandparents would, yep. would be in that same kind of brackets. And... I think that, you know, those wars had a huge impact on the human species that we don't talk about that much. In fact, I don't think we really acknowledge history. I've had this conversation recently with um, some people about how, you know, the lack of talking about that experience because it was so painful to talk about means that a lot of people in today's world don't really know the history of the world and how it went the way it went. Mm. You know, I think a lot of people look back on the history and they go, how did those people not see the war coming, you know? And the reality is that we could be headed to a war right now. I mean, there's some, there's some, we're on the verge of civil wars in America in some ways yes. at the moment. And I think that there's a perception in the majority, and this, is, this speaks to why I got off social media too, because that social media to me is misrepresentative of what's really happening in the world and how good or bad the world is at this time. I think that if you take all your understanding of how the world works from social media and from uh, televised news, then you'd think the world's about to catch on fire. Um, But yet I look out the window and I don't see any evidence of that. And, um, and we forget why, like, you know, we, we, we have trauma in our bodies that we don't talk about. Um, yes. Generational trauma, you know, from those wars, the emotional deadening, the lack of communication, the approaches to raising children with discipline, um, you know, all of these things have had a huge impact. And uh, to me, I mean, this book, and I'm only halfway through this book, The Body Keeps the Score, but the writer talks about trying to instigate um, measures of the impact of childhood trauma into the American psychiatry um, or psychological um, document, the document they use for insurance and for classification and diagnosing and all that kind of thing. And, you know, he says childhood trauma has a bigger impact in the world than pretty much anything else that we identify. Yeah. Um, 
And to me, I truly believe that. I think, you know, if we could just get raising children right, you, you wouldn't have as many villains in the world as we have right now. Um, because, of course, a villain is really just someone who, unless they're a psychopath, but psychopaths generally don't make their way to the top of offices. You know, they don't, they don't become leaders of countries because people sniff that they're psychopaths. Yes. Um, but anyone who's uh, someone in a position of power if they're not using that power with vulnerability and honesty and responsibility, um, which you can do if you understand yourself well, um, then then they can be corrupted by that power. And that's not because they intend to be corrupted. That's because they're a human being and we can all be corrupted by power. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 couldn't agree, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, just a couple of things you've touched on. Uh, so my dad was the son of a World War World War One veteran who fought at uh, Gallipoli. So wow. my grandpa actually fought there. And, the, you know, the movie that had Mel Gibson in it, the actual movie Gallipoli, that yeah. was, a, that was a, called the Battle of the Neck. Um, my grandfather was actually wounded in that same battle. And so wow. he ended up back in Egypt, recovered, went back to war again, but then came back out. But, yeah, as soon as he came back, he was a shattered man. My, my dad was a young guy. Um, obviously, you know, my grandpa came back, had kids, but never talk about that. So my dad had no emotion in his family. And yeah, so it does, you know, I'm two generations down, but you know, a lot of stuff I've talked about and gone back to speak to my dad about is because of, you know, what happened to my grandpa and how he yeah. came out of the back of that war. Um, you know, so there is this generation that, that is impacted definitely by that. Um, and, and the other one to be slightly controversial the conversation is, you know, how could Hitler or Stalin actually end up uh, coercing all these people to be seen to be, you know, this, um, you know, supremacist or have these people believe in, in their ideals? We look at that and go, how could they fall for that? Mm. However, we're all walking around with masks. We're all walking, we're all locked down into our houses and we're all believing what's coming out of our governmental leadership about what's right or wrong. So, mm. I don't see much dissimilar outside of the absolutely wrong things that they did during the war with the Jew family, your Jewish and you know, all the Holocaust night sort of stuff. But to take a step back about how did he get people to believe in him, we've just got to have a look at what's happening now. We, we, the amount of people who aren't critically thinking, doing their own research, questioning is this actually right or wrong, are those numbers right or wrong, is should we be doing this? Is it right or wrong? Just taking lead because a couple of senior people believe it's right. Um, you know, there's a good example about how maybe you can end up in a regime that ends up embodying full control and power. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more. I think that there's um, there's a fair amount of a surface understanding of the way that. Um, the world works and the way that psychology works and the way that um, complex systems of government work, um, how uh, how race works, how our response to race is, uh, what that is, um, how how our, our understanding of ourselves can really colour our perception of the world and particularly our own traumas if left un, unexplored um, or if left uninquired with um, how they can colour our perception of the world. Mm. Um, in this isolation period, I definitely, when I was going through the darker periods of it, even though week to week I was working with a psychologist and connected to the men's communities I'm connected to and, and speaking vulnerably into those spaces, it was day by day I was going through the ups and downs and I really kept distance from many people. I, I didn't. I was talking to my family. I was talking very vulnerably and openly to my mother and father, um, which is a new thing. You know, I made a conscious effort late last year to really open up that dialogue with my mm -hmm. parents because it wasn't, wasn't something that was happening. And, um, and I realised it was my responsibility to, to be, take, take the vulnerable leap forward to kind of demonstrate kind of what I, what, what I kind of wanted. Um, but... I didn't engage with many people and part of it was because I think that I knew if I was engaging with people and hanging out with people and socialising, I think the discomfort and the rage and the, 
the despair and the frustration and the sadness and the grief that was in me would have would have twisted its way out and been projected onto all these other people that I care about. And I would have been telling them what to do with their lives and how to change their lives and rejecting them. And, right. You know, yep. And I guess part of me, I didn't, I thought I was just being afraid to be vulnerable and connect, which I was. And it's pretty hard in the world. And most of my life I've spoken very openly to how I feel with all those around me, my friends, my family. And they, they describe me as deep, particularly my friends, but they don't really reciprocate it. Um, and that used to really bug me, but now I understand more like it's just not how some people live and they might put on the mask and then later reveal that they actually weren't doing so well. Mm. Uh, but it's the ability to even speak to that. I mean, you've got to have the tools to speak to that. You've got to have the language. And if I wasn't doing acting, I don't think I would have gone down the whole path of really acutely looking at um, myself and my psychology and my behavior and my physicality and all those things. Um, because it's not, it's just not something that we are encouraged to put any time into. And yet it has a huge impact on us. Yeah. And uh, I think that, you, we, we can only go for so long in the world until something traumatic happens that tries to snap us into consciousness. Um, and whether that's, whether that's an addiction spiraling into a point where it's like you're basically going to die or not um, and then you're confronted with mortality and I guess that becomes a, a choice. Uh, I mean, that's probably the most common manifestation of that experience, but I also think that people can have a traumatic car crash um, they can be so stressed out in their job that they're not paying attention and they walk out into the street, get hit by a car. Like there are, there are ways in which the world will confront us and make us stop and pay attention. And yes. almost globally the virus has done this to us in a way. It said, okay, time to stop. And I don't know if we got the lesson yet. <laughs> I don't know. If we, <laughs> I'm not sure in Australia. I think in Australia we've kind of dodged the bullet in many ways. Um, I think America was getting the lesson, but then, then the George Floyd thing happened, uh, which is fucking horrible. Um, but we live in a world where that thing went viral so quickly, um, that it illuminated some stuff that was seriously under the surface. And that combined with all of the frustration about being locked up in our homes with everything building, I think has, contributes to what, what happened as a result. Um, mm. And, and then the narrative of all that world is, is a narrative that suits people who feel disenfranchised, who feel like they had lack meaning, who feel like, like they're the victims. It's a very attractive narrative. And um, I've done a lot of study and research into like beyond the surface of what gets repeated on social media. That's why I got off social media again, because I was like, I just don't, in my bones, I just don't feel like there's truth in what's being told to me about what's going on in the world right now. Um, you know, and I'm not, I've never been one who, you know, like I was bullied and I, I had bad situations when I was a kid and I could have turned into a bully myself, but I never did. Like I was always, I was always very, under, I understood very acutely the impact that bullying has. So all the, all the dudes in my school who were like marginalized, I extended a hand to them always, you know, yeah. I, I was really, I didn't really like ganging up on anyone in any kind of context, you know, on the football field, like I hated if I hit someone too hard, I would always be like, oh, sorry, bro. Like, you know? <laughs> yep. um, like I, I don't want to be that damage in the world, but at the same time, I have to respect that there's, there was a rage kind of rising in me mm. and, and I have to find ways to let that out um, because otherwise it does manifest into different shadow behaviors. Um, but anyway, so it's a bit of a side note. But, yeah, I think that, you know, I think that people, I, I don't think that Adolf Hitler was was all that aware of how he was completely taken over in his psychology by all his hate and frustration mm. at the earlier parts of his life. You know, I don't know people, I don't know heaps about Hitler, but I know that he was an artist apparently when he was young and he was he was just dismissed and not not valued and I think he turned you know, um, I don't know much about Stalin. I think I don't know anything about him in terms of him individually. I know that he did, 
um, I'm shocked that we don't really talk about that. It's like it's like he didn't exist. Yes. Um, and we know more about the impact that Nazism had on the world than we do of um, the Soviet occupation. But, you know, I think there was many, many, many more millions in Russia killed, but we don't talk about it. Yeah. Um, and people need to go and read books and do the research because we need to know this stuff because we're going to make the same mistakes. We're kind of sliding in that direction at the moment. Whether we know it or not, everyone thinks there's a utopia. We burn everything down, there's a utopia on the other side. And I'm like, I don't think so. No, that's right. <laughs> not yeah. what history tells us, you know. Um, yeah, so, but, you know, everyone contributes in their own way. And for me, it's about if I get to know myself and I can bring that to bear through acting on a stage, on a camera, and talk to these ideas as bravely as I can, then I think that has can have more impact in the world. Um, yeah, there's a bit of a tangent I went on, but relevant. Uh, no, I, I fully agree. But I and also think that uh, you've probably rolled up and summed up beautifully at the end in that, uh, that last statement that, that you've mm-hmm. done. So um, you've been extremely generous with your time, Jack. Uh, we've probably, and I'm always happy for these to run, you know, longer. Um, but yeah, it's been an, an awesome catch up and an awesome chat. Um, I think there is many things and many topics we could continue to, to discuss and definitely. definitely happy to get you back on again and, and, and have many other conversations. Um, I think we can get in areas like separatism and a whole lot of other elements that, that are happening. But we'll leave that for, for another beautiful, sunny, shiny day in Melbourne yeah. for all those people who don't believe it. It's beautiful and sunny in Melbourne all the time. <laughs> all right. Um, so, Jack, look. Again, awesome. Thanks for coming on the podcast. It's been a really great touching base with you again. Um, I know we've done this one in isolation, but I'm certainly looking forward to the time where we can actually get together down on the, on the beach and uh, you know, yeah. have, have a good hug and a good embrace and enjoy a kombucha and have a good chat about and go for a stroll along, along the water. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. so take care, man. It's been really great chatting to you and uh, we'll touch base really soon. Yeah, thanks, Miller. Thanks so much for inviting me on and thanks for the great conversation, man. Um, no looking forward to next time. All right. Love you, man. Cheers. Love you too. Bye. That was the beautiful and amazing Jack Doherty. Um, I just love that conversation and everything that Jack brought to the table. So wishing Jack all the best on his amazing journey. So um, as always, you can find me on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook and the Awaken app. So from the unearthed man sending you much love and care have a wonderful day